Let's ask for the Lord's blessing on our Bible study tonight. So Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. We thank you that you're the one who's in charge of our life, that you have called us out of the old and into the new, out of death and into life, out of hate and wrath and into peace and love, into the unity of the Holy Spirit, into the unity of the body of Christ, making us into the temple of the living God, giving us your mind, your heart, moving our souls to be alive for God, being part of something great, marvelous in the ages to come, already seated together with you in high places. What an honor. What a privilege. That the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that awaits. All the difficulties, trials, and the what-ifs, and the loss, and the gain, and what does it matter if we lose our own soul? What matters is to gain our soul that you're the one who resurrects and we're living a resurrected life. Lord of glory, I pray for your blessing on this teaching tonight. Let all things be done that edify the body. Let all things be done that glorify Christ. Let all things be said and done that move us to know you better, more, and have a desire to do so. Father in heaven, bless this church. Watch over us, guide us, and keep this church that in the, that in the generations to follow, there would be a church of truth, a church on the bedrock of humility, people who love God and live for you now and forevermore. Adversity strikes, difficulty comes, loss arrives, but we press onward and upward to the higher calling of Christ Jesus, for you are worthy to be praised, worthy to be followed, worthy to know, and worthy to make known. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God, praise God. All right, I'm sure you are already there, but if you would, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. We're looking at verse 5 starting tonight, but for the sake of setting it up, let's start and read verses 1 through 4 just to make sure that we land on verse 5 with an understanding of where we've already covered. It says in Hebrews chapter 5 starting at verse 1, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. Verse 5, where we start tonight. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Starting now at verse 5. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. One who is called by God Almighty, the Anointed One, the Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, reconciling and bringing a, 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 and paying the, the price for sin and fulfilling the law. It says here, and so also Christ did not glorify Himself to become High Priest. Everything is about the introduction of the High Priest. We've gone now into this section where the High Priest is being introduced. Not as Aaron in the Mosaic Covenant, who when Aaron died, his sons took over. And then when his sons passed away, their sons took over. And descendants and descendants and descendants each died and each had to offer for their own sin. But they died in their sins. And they died and therefore could not, could not be high priest. And what's the word say? Come into this place of understanding that he's the high priest forever. As it says in verse 6. And it says, you are a priest forever. Come into this place of seeing that a high priest who's a mediator between God and man. The Bible tells us when Paul wrote to Timothy and he says, there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. The one who stands between God and man. The one who intercedes. The one who represents God to man and man to God. And here we find that Christ did not assert himself. He did not glorify himself as we find natural man loves to glorify himself. Maybe if you go back to the teachings on the Holy Spirit when I did the glory of the Holy Spirit and study a little bit and read and, and let those teachings about the glory and what man does for glory and what God's glory looks like and what it's all about. 
that mankind is always about establishing in a, in a, in his own glory and, and asserting themselves in such a way to gain attention. Remember now, glory is the magnificence of one's presence. That's my definition. The glory is the magnificence of one's presence. Who you are, your position, just as the sun has a glory connected to it, the moon has a, connect, a glory connected to it, and we have a glory connected to us. So in this, you'll find that in the natural, people like to assert themselves and to gain more glory. Like, how do we make a sidewalk more glorious than just the concrete that it is? Well, we put a red carpet on it. You put a red carpet on it, and that concrete turns into something special, right? We added glory to it. We, we have a, 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 a banquet, and everybody now dresses up and puts on a bow tie, and they call it a tuxedo, and you dress a certain way, and you've added, you've added glory to it by adding something to yourself. There was a time, I remember working for a boss who... He would wear a suit for two months and throw it away. Uh, that he would regularly buy a suit, put it on, and then throw it away and wouldn't, and wouldn't give it to anyone because he didn't want anybody to get his, his duds. He threw them away because he wanted to stay current, trendy, sharp. And rather than cleaning them, he threw them away and put another one on. And, uh, and then it would make sure that all the watch, the cufflinks, the tie clips, the hair, the, the car, the shoes, and everything was just... Because you're, you're, you add glory to yourself. You're out of adornment. You're, you're trying to gain a magnificence. And you're, every human nature brought down to who they really and what they are, you realize there's not much glory actually connected to it. I, we just had Hollis's memorial at the cemetery. And Hollis was there and he was what? In a box this big. That's what we reduce it down to. And you realize saying that we can dress it all up, but basically that's what it comes down to. Is that mankind is all about whether it's sports or how do we add something more. Well, if somebody wins the championship, you start throwing champagne or water around. You start trying to, yeah, you start trying to what? Make more than what it is. You won a game. But we have to make it more than what it is. So we add things. We throw glitter around. We do things to confetti from the sky. We do anything to try to add. Churches are doing it today since it's a lack of the Holy Spirit in many churches. And the power lacks and the preaching lacks, the teaching lacks. So instead they add glory by the strobing lights and the louder music and the put on a look that we're successful and we're ministering. And look what we're doing. And here's the Holy Spirit moving. And look how many ministries and how many ministers and look how many people. And look at our building and look at our steeple. Look at our... Trying to add glory because the glory is actually missing. Well, we assert ourselves, we promote ourselves, we magnify ourselves. When you do that, you and I are in the flesh. When we do those kinds of things. Uh, I see, well, going to Africa, of course, I see many, many of the Africans there who love to give themselves titles, names, special jackets, special collars, special cufflinks, trying to, trying to make themselves into ministers that look powerful, give themselves powerful names and titles and call each other that way. Try, what are they doing? Adding magnificence to themselves, asserting, exalting themselves. It says Christ did not do that. Christ did not assert, he did not glorify himself to become high priest. He was not presumptuous to do so. He didn't just assume this place. Rather, he was called to this place. He was appointed to this place. He was chosen, called, consecrated, and appointed to this. And the Holy Spirit came upon him. And the Holy Spirit drove him to the, to, to the wilderness to be tested, to be proven that this is in fact the Christ. He was driven, driven drawn. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. Forty days without food. Driven there into the wilderness. No food to suffer in the flesh. To what? Suffer in the flesh. To suffer in the flesh. And then at the end of forty days of testing, suffering in the flesh, then the enemy came upon him. The devil, the, 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 the devil himself comes and comes against him with all of the various tests at the weakest points of the flesh. Why? To prove, to test that this is in fact the Christ, the anointed one, the appointed one, the consecrated one, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus the Savior. Christ didn't take that position upon himself. Rather, it says he was called and consecrated and appointed and tested and proven to be the high priest. And yet that was the place it began. It will finally culminate at the cross. It began in the wilderness. But it will culminate at the cross. Tested in the wilderness. 
proven in the wilderness, completed at the cross, when he will deny himself and give himself to fully to the Father's will, even unto death of the cross and forsaken by the Father. When he says, you are my son today, I have begotten you. He's actually referencing David's scripture from Psalm 2.7. Matter of fact, if you could put your finger here to, or your marker or ribbon or something for Hebrews 5 and go back to Psalm 2.7. Let's take a quick peek just so that we see that this was spoken by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David a thousand years before the Christ came. A thousand years. A thousand years before Christ came forth born of a woman. This was spoken by the mouth of David, by the Holy Spirit. Remember what Peter said? Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Remember what David said when he wrote in 2 Samuel, I think it's chapter 23, when he says, the Holy Spirit was on my lips, in my tongue. That he knew the Holy Spirit and he spoke for the Holy Spirit. And it says in chapter 2, verse 7, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, he says in verse 8, and I will give you the nations for your inheritage, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Remember what Jesus even said? Go to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. You shall break them with a rod of iron in verse 9. Remember how he's going to rule in Revelation? A thousand year reign with a rod of iron. He says, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. What happened to kind, nice, gentle Jesus? You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel, crushing, rod of iron. Verse 10, now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. What does he want us to learn? What does he want us to know? What's the word of the Lord? Serve the Lord with love, gentleness, politeness, and be nice to everyone. What's it say? With fear and rejoice with trembling. Do you have any idea? who he really is. And when he comes, Jesus himself said, fear the one that can what? Don't fear anybody of this world. Don't fear anybody who has the face of clay. Don't fear, what should you, should we fear? What should we fear? Fear the one. Fear the one who can destroy both body and soul. That's the one you should fear. Come into this place of recognizing that this mighty God deserves our praise, deserves our service, and give him the greatest regard, the greatest fear, and recognize that that's the one that you listen to. No matter what word comes forth, you listen to his word. You listen to his ways. He's the one who's speaking. Hence, what did he say? That he said, the voice came from heaven, and what did he say? This is my beloved son. Hear him. Hear him. Open your ears, open your heart, open, hear him. Faith comes by hearing. Come into this place of knowing that the word has come from heaven. And if you and I deny the word that's come from heaven, if you and I deny the call of God that's crying out, come. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And we deny and we don't hear or we are indifferent to the voice that's come from heaven. And you deny the very voice of God. What remains left for you and I? Nothing. He says now in verse 12, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. But then he adds this at the final end, Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Oh, yes, Lord, amen. May we be that group. It's not assumed, and it cannot be presumed upon. Oh, Lord, that we would truly fear you and rejoice. How should we rejoice? With trembling. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. How many times the psalmist says blessed, blessed, and adds often these blessed are those, blessed are these. Come into this place of understanding that there's a blessing of the living God. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Blessed are those and happy are those who make the Lord God their God. Come into this place, blessed are those who do not turn aside to the lie. Blessed are those who do not give regard to the proud. Blessed are those, all of these blessings, we say blessing, 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 but blessing are those, blessing is this. We have to put ourselves into recognize as the people of God. Who should we be? We don't assert ourselves and assume salvation as many are doing today. 
live the way we want. Talking to Katie today, says the philosophy of today's American church, modern Christianity, and you've heard me say this before, I'll do what I want, when I want, how I want, unto the Lord. And they put Jesus' name on it, but we do whatever we want, how we want, when we want, and I see it everywhere. Make our own decisions, do what we want. Jesus loves me, yes I know. Bible told me he loves me, so therefore I must be loved. Doesn't matter how I live, what decisions, who I rely on. Doesn't matter what I fear, what regard. What I, as long as I know that God, yeah, you love me, you give me grace, and I'll do what I want, when I want, how I want, and I'll just do it unto you, Jesus. And somehow we assume ourselves into heaven. The things people tell themselves come in instead of recognizing the Word of God has spoken and we are to be in alignment with the Word, not the Bible coming into alignment with our Word, but our Word coming into alignment with His. It says, come into this place of recognizing back to Hebrews, if you would, please. That Christ did not assume this. He served in the capacity of high priest. He was proving. He was being tested and proven that He was in fact the Lord's high priest. The one to be mediator between God and man. The truly the one to be God Almighty in the flesh, to be the high priest between God and man. And he could sympathize with our weaknesses. Remember we read that in chapter 4? He could sympathize with our weaknesses because he himself walked in this body of flesh. He himself dealt with wilderness walk. He himself dealt with the assault of man. He himself dealt with all of the difficulties, trials, and he himself dealt with all of these things. I thirst, I hunger, he wept, he saw, he felt, he had all of these things. He could identify, he could sympathize, he could empathize with us so therefore we're not left alone with a high priest that's indifferent and say, oh, smarten up. Even though you do hear the Holy Spirit through Paul say, grow up. But he's not in a sarcastic tone of like, you're nobody and you're nothing, you're just my peons. Rather, he came and walked with us peons. And he can sympathize and empathize, but says, but you have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, get out of your weakness, get out of the flesh, get out of immaturity, get out of indifference, get out of all these things, and come out of the world, out of darkness, out of the natural, and into his glorious light. Walk in the light as he is in the light. Walk in the body of Christ. Walk circumspectly. Walk in love. Walk as he walks. Oh, he says in Ephesians 5, what does he say? To be imitators of God as dear children. How can that possible? How can I walk as a... As an imitator of God, he's given me his Holy Spirit, God Almighty, in me. Just as God was in Christ, so God Almighty is now in you, in us, in the body. And he's to deny self and live as that Holy Spirit person. That's right, you're to be a Holy Spirit person. No longer under the unclean spirits that are in this world. No longer under the devilish spirits of this world. No longer under the demonic sway of this world. You are called to be a Holy Spirit person. How can I do that? I've given you a new creation. You're the very product, the fruit of His Holy Spirit presence. You're not just now a new creation in the sense that you've been separated, like born outside of Him. Rather, you've been born of Him. You're no longer created like the world around is created outside of him. You are now a new creation born of him. Therefore, you're to grow and mature just to be like him. And if you sin, if you have a problem, if you're weakness, you have an advocate in heaven. The great high priest who's interceding for you and is your advocate. As we'll find on later on with Hebrews. And if you have difficulties here. Gary, Christ is in heaven. If you have difficulties here and trials and you're frustrated and falling short and you're hearing devilish lies and Holy Spirit is here groaning and interceding for you with prayers you can't even utter. You're not left alone. You're not left distant and orphaned and cut off and, but rather by simply calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ you will be saved. You are being saved. You will be saved. You're on the salvation road. When was I saved? When Christ was crucified on the cross before time even began, he saw me. When Christ was on the cross, he was saving me. When I was born, he was saving me. When I gave my life to the Lord, he was saving me. And what's he doing right now? Saving me. When will I be saved? When I'm finally free of this body. When I'm finally be fully, fully delivered, fully free and saved. Saved! No longer under his wrath but now in the body of Christ fully and completely. This is our high priest that we're serving today. It says in 
Luke chapter 1 verse 32 said of the Christ, He will be great, and He will be called Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David. He is not only the high priest, but what is He? King and Lord. No place else, no place else. Now hear me, this is important to know, and we referenced it last time. Important to understand that, that this Christ, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, is not like Aaron was, that he was just the high priest, or his descendants. But rather, he is a king slash priest, or dash priest. He is both king and priest. In the, in the time of Israel, when they were, had their kings and their priests and the, and the Mosaic Covenant, and they had all things according to the Old Testament, meaning the Mosaic Covenant. Old Testament isn't Abraham's covenant. Old Testament is covenant with Moses. It's a broken covenant, a breached covenant. No longer to be, to be looked at the Mosaic Covenant as though it has any rule or law over us anymore. Rather, it's the Old Covenant, and it was breached, cut, broken. And here it says that you had the times of the kings. You had all of the kings from, from Saul and David and Solomon and Rehoboam. And, then you, and you had Abijah and you had Asa and you had Jehoshaphat. And you had all the kings down through. 19 of them in Judah. 19 of them in Israel. When the kingdom was split. And kings were kings and they came from kings. And they were supposed to come from the Davidic line as it showed up in, the, in Judah, the southern kingdom. All of the kings in the southern kingdom, Judah... We're all from David's line. The ones that I just quoted to you were all from David's line. They weren't priests. They were kings. They weren't to, to do the duties of the priest. Anytime you find that one of the priests, one of the kings decided to act like a priest, he was cut off like it was with Uzziah. Anytime they acted in such a way that, that there was a, 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 a dividing line between them, that the priest came from Aaron, the Levites, Aaron's lineage. And the kings were to come from David's lineage. So a priest could never be, a, a king could never be a priest and a priest could never be a king. Separated. Judah, Aaron's line, Levi. Levi, Judah. Aaron, David. Separation. So how can, and this was what the Hebrews is addressing, how can this be? If they're separated, division, if there's one from the Aaron's lineage and one's from David's lineage and the kings come from here and the priests come from here. How can this be? How can Christ who is of David's lineage be our high priest? How can that be? He says because it's not according to Aaron. It's not according to the Mosaic Covenant. It's not according to Levi. It's not according to all the old things of time past. But rather it's according to Melchizedek. Melchizedek and you go back and you see oh with the time of Abraham. Way back then 2,000 years before Christ came? 4,000 years from today? Back then? That promise when Abraham was sitting on a mountaintop and met Melchizedek? And he was called the king priest of the God Most High? And Abraham paid tithes to him? Which will be covered as we go to Hebrews. That comes up as well. And it says that this great man, this great king priest... Nothing was ever said of him beyond that. Like, it was referenced in the Psalms once, and all of a sudden it shows up and says, No, the Christ is the priesthood according to Melchizedek, where the king priests are one. Oh, it's not Aaron. It's not the Mosaic Covenant. It's not after the flesh. It's not after genealogy. It's not according to Moses. It's not according to Aaron. It's not according to Levi. It's not according to Jew. It's nothing to do with genealogy. That's why Paul writes and says, Don't get caught up in all this genealogy business. But rather, you're of the order of Melchizedek. Oh, and you live forever. You've beaten death. You've beaten the devil. You're raised up. So you're now an eternal priest that never has to die again, never has to offer again. So you can intercede for how long? Forever. You're our priest forever. You mean that's what's really going on? You mean the priest isn't the guy with the white collar in the building down the street? You mean the priest isn't the guy that we call Monsignor and Bishop and Cardinal with a hat on top? We're not, 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 not that guy. The guy with the red robe, that's not him. You mean the, the Episcopalian Anglican and all this stuff, the priest? The, I mean, this is the priest? Yes, this is the only one that deserves the title, Your Holiness. It's not the Dalai Lama. Like, oh, I get infuriated. 
when he arrives at the White House and they all start bowing and calling me holiness, I feel like wringing his neck. How pastoral of me. Exactly right. Drive away the wolf. Very, very pastoral. Very shepherdy. Drive the wolf away. Kill the coyote. Get rid of all things that seek to devour the flock. I don't want nothing to do with it. You come to this place of recognizing that he's my high priest. He didn't assert himself. He didn't presume. Rather, he was called, fitted. He is the high priest because he is the high priest. He is the high priest. And he's the king. And he's the high priest. And he's both of these. He's of the order of Melchizedek. And this is the main point that Hebrews is making. Don't get caught up in Mosaic Covenant. Don't get caught up in Aaron's lineage. Don't get caught up in the priesthood of, of all the ones that are currently sitting at the temple. Don't get caught up in all that. Look instead and realize what God is actually doing. He actually has brought forth a forever priesthood that he has mediator now and forevermore. Forever he's our mediator. That anything can ever be said, anything disparaging about, that's mine. He's, he's advocate for me. He's my priesthood and the Holy Spirit is here in me battling for me and he's in heaven battling for me. For who? For me? Why me? Because I've given you his Holy Spirit. That's why. Because you're mine because I made you mine. How? Because I gave you my Holy Spirit. That's what makes you mine. How can I, how can I then deny such a thing? Oh, hence all the warnings that go on. Remember we talked about the warnings when we started this class? There's the warnings. Hebrews is all about warnings. As a matter of fact, if you look at chapter 2, when he says in verse 1 and 2, and it says, and 3, Therefore we must give more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we, what? Drift away. How easy it is to drift away. How does a boat drift away? Not moored. Not anchored. Not tied. Not secure. Drift away don't even know. I've been in a boat where the anchor let go and we're kind of just sitting there fishing and we're kind of lounging and sleeping. Kara and I were there and all of a sudden you're realizing, how did we get here? You look around and say, we're like 300 feet away. How'd that happen? No longer connected. Drift away. Don't even know it. Just, just drift away. But he gives that warning and he says in verse 2, for if the word spoken through the angels proved steadfast that in every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we what? neglect so great a salvation warning number one warning number two comes here when he says in chapter 3 of verse 8 do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion unbelief rebellion unbelief turning away from he says what beware careful you can ha this could happen to you too they were all called first Corinthians chapter 10 covers all of this review that on sometime when you have, do devotions and he says in verse 12 evil heart chapter 3 verse 12 what's he say evil heart of unbelief unbelief is what evil the evil heart filled with unbelief well wait a minute I believe I agree with all of this no you're an unbeliever because your life is reflecting decisions actions of unbelief statements of unbelief people get bothered sometimes I'll say that's unbelief at work that's not unbelief at work like they're like offended with it but it is when you're in the natural when you're thinking natural when you've got worldly endeavors when you're filled with weaknesses emotions that's unbelief God Almighty's called you to believe God live for the Word of God also we find now as we're approaching this third warning coming into chapter 5 when we're going to be getting there so let's just look at it we're not there yet but let's at least look at it when he talks about the lack of maturity when he says in in uh, chapter 5 verse 11 of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing like that's three stings isn't it Three stings that have happened, and there's two more coming. As a matter of fact, it says in, in verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 12, that you do not become, chapter 6, verse 12, that you do not become what? Sluggish. Have you ever seen a slug? Kind of tells the whole story, doesn't it? Yeah, just look at a slug. Kind of tells the whole story. You say, oh, you know those slugs that you look at and say, oh, yeah, that's you, that's me. Slug, barely moving, crawling along, nothing. You just kind of... What, what's, what's the word for it? Sluggish! It doesn't come up with another word for it. A slug is what? Sluggish. So he's warning us. 
for that not to happen, that's why he says in chapter 6, verse 1, what does he say? Go on to what? Chapter 6, verse 1, what does he say? Go on to perfection. That press on, move onward, press on. Don't give up, don't get indifferent, don't let immaturity rob you. Don't drift away, don't neglect, don't be indifferent, don't go this way. Don't be sluggish, don't let unbelief rob you. Don't be dull of hearing. In other words, what's all these things that can happen to us? All the things I just said. It's so easy to happen. I see churches everywhere doing it. Ministers, people, just allowing this all to take place. Rather than encouraging and edifying and warning one another to press onward and upward to the higher calling of Christ Jesus. Hebrews is a warning book. Hebrews is a warning book. It's a letter of warning. And there's three of them, four of them we just gave you. To warn us, to remember, wait a minute. Shake up. Don't assume salvation. Don't assert yourself. Many people today are looking to go to church just so that they feel saved. But you don't want to feel saved. You want to live saved. You don't want to just tell yourself what I had an experience 20 years ago at the altar and I remember God met me and I must be okay. No, 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 no. You should have an experience today. You should have confidence today. Your conscience should be clear and excited and renewed today. You want to be revived today. You want to be reawakened today. You want to live for him today. And then what do we do tomorrow? Tomorrow is the tomorrow is tomorrow's today. Make sense? Tomorrow is tomorrow's today. So when we wake up, it's now today. So do what? Do the same thing you did today. Live for the Lord. Press onward. It's can easy, easily. Things come. I'm dealing with it now. Things come. Dealing with it here in our own church local area, or dealing with down that's going on with my own family and concerns and so what are we going to do? We're going to fall to our knees. Go to bed at night. Fall to your knees. Lord of glory, trusting in you. Looking to you. I'm yours. You're mine. Amen. Right? Get up in the morning. Good morning, Lord. That's, it's as simple as that. Good morning, Lord. Going to praise you. Walking around the house. Singing unto the Lord. Calling upon his holy name. It's that way that you recognize saying, Lord, you're working out a plan. This is exciting news. Not fun. Exciting. Not fun. It's not amusement park faith. You know? Ooh, I like that ride. I don't like this ride. All right? But it's exciting seeing the adventures of God, how it's going to work, what's going to be said, what's going to be done, what's, who's going to move, how, what's the strategy, how is he going to deliver? It's, it's exciting stuff. Not fun, not amusement park faith, but exciting faith to see you're going to move. Because remember now, at the brink, at the brink of bleakness is the blessing of God. At the brink. Now, why do I say that? And here I am. At, it's at the brink of bleakness. It's like, this is, I don't know how this is going to work out. This is, looks, what's that word that goes with less? Hope? Hopeless. It looks hopeless. Hopeless. There's no way you look around and say, this is, we're trapped. And yet in all of this, I was thinking of, I was th the other day I was thinking on Hezekiah when he was trapped in Jerusalem with the Assyrian soldiers all around him. I mean, that's trapped. Isn't that trapped? Whereas you've got the boasters out there, the warriors, and say, what nation has ever stood up against us? What nation, what God has ever delivered anyone? They would have piles of bones. They would put carcasses on their city walls to put fear and intimidation of all the other nations that if we capture you, if you make us fight you and capture you, this is what will happen to you. But if you just surrender, then we'll just absorb you. People would just give up. Hezekiah is standing firm. Standing firm. But he's standing firm with this. I have not a clue what to do. <laughs> right? <laughs> but when I don't know what to do, what do you hear me say? I always know what to do. Even when I don't have a clue what to do, I always know what to do. You call upon the living God and say, Lord, you're, you're the one at the brink of bleakness is the blessing of God. You're right there. Deliverance shall surely come. I don't know whether it'll come this way or that way, but I know this. It's not the hand of man I'm looking to. It's the hand of God. The Bible doesn't say such, but archaeological digs of the Assyrian Empire back in the 19th century found an Assyrian inscription that in, in, in its uh, files, and it says, I had Hezekiah trapped in a bird, like, uh, trapped like a bird in a cage. Interesting, huh? Found that. Hezekiah. I had Hezekiah trapped. Sennacherib. King of Assyria. Sennacherib. I had Hezekiah trapped like a bird in a cage. Day in and day out. Day in and day out. 
trapped here in that Rabshakeh, the ambassador speaking. What God is ever, don't let, don't let the people speak in Hebrew, trying to, all this day in, day out, till one day not. Right? Till one day not. How long was Goliath sitting in that valley? One day he showed up. <laughs> Blasphemous words coming out with this big monstrous nine and a half foot body, vocal cords the size of my head. <laughs> Day two, rah, rah, who's, rah, rah, who's the fight of the living God? Number three, number four, number five, day 39, yeah, who's going to stand there? Then day 40 came. Huh? Day 40 comes. See, people, day 40 comes. You know, you can boast in the valley all you want. You can boast and boast and boast all you want till the day you don't, till the day you're not, till the day you can't. 120 years building a boat. 120 years building an ark, hearing it. 120 years, da, 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 all the people, till they didn't. Same way, all of this going on and all this talk, I don't pay it no mind. Is it fun? No, I don't like that. Is it, is, is it amusing? Is it, oh yeah. But just this, saints of God, the day comes when it's not. God Almighty is the one who brings deliverance. God Almighty is the one you can trust. And he's telling, telling the Hebrews here, the Hebrew saints. He's not writing to the Hebrews as a nation. He's writing to the Hebrew saints. Yes? The saints that were born Hebrew, who were caught in Judaism, who are now being entertained and being taught to yield to Judaism, the, the, the order of religion according to Mosaic Covenant, according to the Aaronic priesthood. He's saying, don't listen to that. This is our high priest. This is our king priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the new covenant, not the Mosaic covenant. This is the Christ, the Christ covenant. You live for God. And he's pressing them on. Yes? That's what he's doing for us today. Not everybody listens, but those who are gods will listen. He says in John chapter 8, verse 54, he writes and says this, John chapter 8, verse 54, he says this, Jesus answered to those who are, who are questioning him and calling him into question. If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Christ didn't honor himself. It's God who honored him. It's God who spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. It's God Almighty who honored him. In John chapter 8, Verse 48, he writes this, John chapter 8, verse 48, told Christ that he, they said, you have a demon. And then in verse 50, he says this, I don't seek my own glory. I don't seek my own glory. I'm not looking for my own desires. I'm not looking to assert myself and presume upon anyone. I'm not seeking my own glory. They straight away come to him and say, you have a demon. I'm not seeking my own glory. He says in chapter 12, verse 23, John Chapter 12, verse 23, he says this. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be what? Glorified. Says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Wait a minute, now, he's going to be glorified? That's right, the Father is about to glorify the Son, and the Son is about to glorify the Father. How's that going to happen? How's that going to take place? The cross. The cross. The wonderful cross. He says in John chapter 12 verse 28, shortly, five verses later, Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. Father, glorify your name. Make, make your presence known. Make your name known. Glorify your name. And a, and a voice from heaven comes. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. The hour has come that the Son of Man, that's the God Almighty said, my beloved Son, the hour has come that the Son will be glorifying the Father and the Father will glorify the Son. Where is this all going to happen? At the cross. At the cross. The denial of the flesh. The Father will glorify the Son. The Son will glorify the Father. How? By denying His own will and preferring the Father's will. By suffering in the flesh on the cross that He might beat death and the devil, separating Himself from all that is not of God. It says in John chapter 13, 31. John chapter 13, 31. At the time of his betrayal, he's being betrayed. It says, so when he had gotten out, gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, 
and God is glorified in him. God the Father will glorify himself in Christ. Christ himself will glorify the Father. Where? At the cross. So how is it for you and I? Turn, if you will, keep your finger here at Hebrews 5. Turn, if you will, now to Galatians chapter 5, if you would, please. Looking at verse 24 and 25. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 and 25. Powerful section of scripture worth memorizing. Everybody seems to focus on the fruit of the Spirit. These are the two verses that follow the fruit of the Spirit. So when you're looking at Galatians chapter 5 and you look at the fruit of the Spirit and somebody talks about the fruit of the Spirit, don't forget to add these two verses as well. When it says, looking at verse 24 and 25, and those who are Christ have what? Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What's going on today in today's modern Christianity is we're preferring our passions and desires. We're excusing them under the great that God, God's grace is for us and He knows my heart. But in actuality, if you have the Christ, you will crucify those passions and desires of the flesh. You will crucify that flesh, deny yourself, turn away from, and therefore bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. How can we quote the fruit of the Spirit of verse 23, 22, and 23 and deny verse 24? You must accept all of them. And then he says in verse 25, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to know the Spirit. How do you and I glorify the Father? Go to the cross. How is the Father glorified in you? To the cross. What was for Christ is also for you. You who have received the Holy Spirit, you and I, must also crucify our flesh. Hence, that great verse, that triple, triple prescription from Christ, to pick up your cross, deny yourself, follow Him. This is the prescription for our life in Christ. This is our prescription for salvation. This is our threefold. If you're going to take a pill every day, take that one. Take that one and apply it to your life. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. Take, do that and live. It's as easy as that. Coming by the way of the Holy Spirit. So we look at verse 5 of chapter 5, dealing with the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 5, verse 5. Today I have begotten you. The Christ was, was begotten of the Lord. In the same way that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, so the Holy Spirit overshadowed you. The Holy Spirit brought forth the Christ in Mary's womb. The Holy Spirit is bringing forth the seed of Christ in you. The same, Christ, the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that's going to raise you from the dead. You're in the body of Christ. Hence, in Ephesians chapter 5, when he says that you're seated together with him, I mean chapter 2, you're seated together with him in high, heavenly places. He's treating you as though you're already there, because you are. The old is gone, the new has come. Proceeding now to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6, when he says, and he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, which we have addressed. That comes from Psalm 110, verse 4 the other place that it's mentioned. The book of Hebrews continually brings up this new high priest according to Melchizedek. We saw it already in a couple places and it's all now through the book coming to this place of recognizing that we have now a better high priest, a better covenant, a new, a new heaven is coming. All things new. You've been made new. God's ushering in the new covenant. And we have a new high priest and a new law and a new Jerusalem. All things new. So the old is past. And we have our king priest according to Melchizedek. If you look at chapter 5 verse 10 when he says, Called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He says it again. Just before he talks about being dull of hearing. He reminds them that they have a, a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, the one that was introduced with Abraham back in the days of Genesis. And he's pressing them to go on to perfection, as we talked about from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Looking at this order that has come forth, he says in chapter 6, verse 20, chapter 6, verse 20, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, and he names Jesus, having become the high priest forever. What's the last words? According to the order of Melchizedek. He says it again. 
coming to this place that he's driving this, this, this book of Hebrews is driving this point home. It's like, church, get it. Hebrew Christians, get it. Recognize it's not Judaism and Judaizers. It's not circumcision of the flesh and the natural. It's not Aaron's priesthood. It's not, the, it's not David in the natural. It is in the spirit where Christ is now forever your high priest, king priest, now and forevermore. No one else is coming. No one else is coming. He is the priest forever. He's the king and the Lord. Every knee shall bow that you're the Lord. You're the king of kings, the Lord. No one else is coming. If you neglect this one, no one else is coming. If you're dull of hearing, no one else is coming. If you refuse to seek the Lord, no one else is coming. This is it. It's not going to do, there's no do-overs. I know when I used to play sports on the street with the kids when we were in Riverside, remember all the kids would gather and if, if somebody messed up, what was the word? Do-over. Always the do-over. Let's do a do-over. There's no do-overs. There's no one else coming. This is it forever everlasting you got to get it right we got to get it right how do I get it right recognize who he is and now seek him live for him he's your Lord and commander he is your priest and your high priest your advocate now and forever he's your mediator there's no one else coming I know when I was a kid and you heard me tell you this going inside that little Catholic booth remember going to the booth sit down kneel down the guy was sitting there Shh, move the, I had to confess make up my sins make them up had to come up. Not so heavy that I get too much to do. Not so light that I look like I'm not sinning. Right? Make them up. Come up. You know. I had always my telltale ones. All my same ones. It got me basically two Our Fathers and ten Hail Marys. You know? Bang. Done. You know? All this stuff that we do. Right? I could whip out those prayers in 30 seconds. I can still say that prayer. I can say Hail Mary as fast as anybody. Still to this day. It's embedded in me. But it got me nowhere. Nowhere. You know, I'm stations of the cross, going down, light my candle, get the thing put on my neck, ashes on, all kinds of stuff that we did. That aroma they have swinging that thing around. All that stuff that we did. You know? Bow down, genuflex, this, that, you know? People come down, they bow, sit there, and then put their backside on the pew and sit there with look like they're kneeling. Fakers! All the things that people... We gotta get this right! How do I get this right? There's not, it, the Bible even tells you, it's not so great that you have to climb to heaven to get it. It's not so, it's so buried in the earth that you have to dig for the rest of your life trying to find it like gold. Or, he's made it simple. It's right there next to you. It's right next to your ears. It's right next to your mouth. It's right there. Simply believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just agree with it. Not just acknowledge it. I accept you, Lord. Like, we're so high-minded with it. We make movies about it. We, we have churches that just say, Would you accept him today? I accept him. Like, so high-minded. Get on your knees and accept him and live for God now and forevermore. Deny yourself. That's what he's saying here, is it not? It's not just we have, remember down at North Point, we've got the teacher. Don't, now on, don't have people raise their hands. Everybody close your eyes. Everybody bow your head. Now, if you want to accept the Lord, don't raise your hand because somebody may hear the rustling of their clothes and they'll know it's you. So instead, just nod your head and I'll see you. So go ahead, nod your head. I see you. Oh my goodness. Are you kidding me? That's salvation today? Salvation has been turned down to a nod that no one sees, no one knows, and no one's to be looking around. I know the first time I had my altar calls, everybody's eyes open. Everybody's, you don't be concerned about their eyes, be concerned about that eye. Everyone's eyes open. Do you remember I've had altar calls? Whoever doesn't want the Lord, stand up. Remember I had those altar calls? So I can assume that all of you sitting down want the Lord. Whoever doesn't want the Lord, stand up. Everyone sits there. I can assume that all of you are saying yes. Then we're witnesses against you, yes? Oh, how harsh of you, Pastor. No, how truthful. Is righteousness too harsh for you? Has that we become in church now? Righteousness is too harsh for you? Truth is too harsh for you? Then I tell you, you're in the natural and you love your sin. You love your natural affections. Rather than coming to understand who he really is. I've had to apply this to my own life by the Holy Spirit. I apply it to your life. Apply it to my own grandkids. Yes, Adam? Coming to this place of knowing who he is. Them according to the order of Melchizedek. It says in scripture, Jesus said, you search the scriptures for eternal life. Then what's he say? These are they that testify of me. Right here, we just read two of them. Melchizedek, you didn't even, you didn't even know it. 
You dull of hearing. You didn't know it. That's right, because we're so natural here. We didn't even know it. Didn't even hear it. This had to be explained to me. Like, I don't know how many times I've studied and read. What, I, I, don't I don't get it. Like, right now I'm preaching it. There was a time where I'm, and I'm teaching it. And there was a time where I was, like, I don't get it. Like, what's going on in the Mosaic Covenant, the New Covenant, the Aaron priesthood, and the Melchizedek? I don't get Like, what's going on? And I had to unravel it. No one, everything I'm reading, no one's explaining it. I had to work it through and figure out, like, oh, that's what's going on. I got it. And then I read, you dull of hearing. I say, yeah, that was me. That's me. I couldn't get it. What? Because I didn't know. Because I'm dull of hearing. Call it what it is. You didn't know. Dull of hearing. I can't get it. That's not just no one's teaching me. It's because you're, you're not getting it. You don't have the makeup to get it. Coming to this place of recognizing that, that you and I don't want to be dull of hearing. I want to hear his voice. I want to be sharpened by it, not dulled by it. Have you ever had a nice knife that got dull on you? Like, you know, I've had knives that, like fishing knives or hunting knives, or there's a favorite knife, and all of a sudden you, or a chainsaw. Do you ever have a chainsaw? I hit it, I hit it, like, yeah, I got it all sharpened, working great, and all of a sudden I see sparks rolling out from under it, and I say, oh, I hit a rock. And now the thing is what? Dull. Now you're pushing, trying to, because you don't want to go sharpen it. You know, trying to make it work. Trying to get through that log, trying to finish your work so you don't have to go what? Sharpen it. So you apply all that extra energy, all that extra time, and you're moving it into the saw's blades boost. The thing's grinding through, trying to cut it. How come I'm working so hard to get that same log cut? Not sharp. Amazing how easy it is when it's sharp. When it's sharp, it draws the blade in. The teeth grab the blade, and they, and they suck it right through the wood. And the chips are flying out. Load up your, your boots with, with shavings. It sucks the blade right in. You just put it on there. It sucks it right in. But when it's dull, you're work and stress. And people say, oh, it's so hard. It's because you're dull. That's why it's so hard, because you're dull. Dull of hearing. Dull of obedience. Dull. And when you're dull, you have to apply all that extra energy to try to drive it in. But when you're sharp, it, drives, it sucks you in. The truth brings you in. Holy Spirit brings you in. When you hear people say, it's so, it's so hard, that's because you're dull of hearing. I don't want to hear that. That's what the truth is. That's what's going on, for me or for you. So we come to this place of recognizing who is he and what's going on in our lives here. Well, let's look at verse 7 now, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. What a great scripture. Especially when you look and you realize that he said earlier about that he can empathize and sympathize with our weaknesses. It gives a glimpse into the Garden of Gethsemane time that Christ had. It gives a glimpse as to what he dealt with at the Garden of Gethsemane or when he withdrew from the crowd or when he called upon the Father. It gives a glimpse of what was going on inside of him, where he was at and what he dealt with. And it says here in, in verse uh, 7, who in the days of his flesh. Wait a minute now. In the days of his flesh also means what? No longer this way. There was days that he was in the flesh, where Christ was in the flesh, but it's not this way anymore. There was a time when his time was fulfilled, the time for Christ to come. Matter of fact, if you would, keep your ribbon here, keep your finger here, keep your pen here. Look back to Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. Galatians, go back to Galatians chapter 4, 1 through 7. And we'll be honing in specifically at verse 4, but let's read verses 1 through 7 just to get a context of what he's saying here. He says in Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 1, Now I say that the heir as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, through, though he is the master of all, but is under guardian and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. 
powerful section of scripture. Now keep in mind, he's not writing to the Jews here, he's writing to the Gentiles, who are now Christian. And he's calling them heirs, and calling them sons, and calling them uh, that, uh, out of the old and into the new body of Christ, that in Christ you become heir. You become one with Christ. You receive all that was meant for Christ. You are an heir in his death, in his life. You receive all. But notice in verse 4 it says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God's timing, God's time frame, at this specific time, at this hour, now is the time for Gabriel to come. Now is the time for him to speak to Mary. Now is the time for Simeon to hear the, hear the, hear, see the baby. Now is the time for Anna, who's been looking forward, and will pray over and see the Christ. Now is the time where the shepherds will see the angels in heaven. Now is the time. Here it is, the time fulfilled. John the Baptist's ministry has begun. Now is the time for all of this to take place. God's timetable. And you see that we find that he was begotten. And here in the book of Hebrews, it's referencing that today I've begotten you. Today is the days of your flesh. The days of your flesh began when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and brought forth this child, Jesus. And you shall call his name Jesus. The time of his flesh had begun. And the time of his flesh will end at Calvary. The days, the days of his flesh, the days where we will look upon this man, and there was nothing, remember what the Bible says, Isaiah said, there was nothing comely about him, nothing that would draw your attention, nothing that would look at and say, wow, handsome man, or rugged man, or, or there was nothing about him that would look and say, wow, that, that's a good specimen of a man. There was nothing about him, just a guy, just nothing that would draw you or look to or say, now that man has got to be anointed. That man has got to be, no way. He didn't look kingly, he didn't look priestly, he didn't look, what? Anything. Just a guy. Nothing about his appearance that would draw you that you could judge this way or that way. Jesus, remember he said, do not judge according to appearances. That's what Jesus said. He said, do not judge. People like to stop there. But he added this. Do not judge according to appearances. Do not judge by what you're seeing. There was nothing about him that you could look and say, ah, kingly. Oh, put a royal robe on him. Royal robe on him. Oh, get a crown. Oh, what a priest must be. Look at this. Look how anointed. Look, nothing about him that would draw your attention that you'd be able to distinguish that he was this way or that way. But he was the Christ and a body was prepared for him. Coming to this place of seeing who he really is, it says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10 looking at verse 5. This Christ who was born of a woman, this Christ who was brought forth by the Virgin Mary, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. He says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5, and of course we'll be getting there at some point, but we're not there now. But at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 he says, Therefore when he came into the world he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. A body you have prepared for me. The Christ had a body prepared for him knowing who he is and what his ministry was. Coming to this place of now seeing 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44 to 50. Look, if you would, now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter, as oftentimes it's referred to. Verse 44. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 44 to 50, when he writes this. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. What we today call human being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual, by the way, this was exemplified with Esau and Jacob. Esau, the fleshly, the beastly, the human, came forth first, and the one of the promised fair skin came second. It says in verse 47, The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born of the image of the man of dust, so we all look like, we also shall bear the image of the heavenly man. Tremendous promise, is it not? Coming to see who he really is, who he is in our life of this, this Christ coming forth, seeing him, 
as the way he was. Now looking at verse 48, when he says, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. Human beings bring forth human beings. Living beings bring forth living beings. Adam and the seed of Adam brought forth human beings, as is the same it is today, as it always has been. Men and women bring forth human beings, living beings, as the man of dust. And as I said and referenced already, as we've had many funerals and we see that dust to dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, so a person is, so they return. They're what they are. But it says, as we bore that image, meaning he's now talking about the people of God, those who are born of God's Holy Spirit, as you and I were born of our parents, human beings, and were in this same body, as we bore that image, now as spiritual, born of God's Holy Spirit, we shall also now one day bear his image. And one day will be, as it says in 1 John, one day will be just like him. As it says in 1 John chapter 3. One day will be just like him. We're going to be just like him. How is that possible? He gave you his Holy Spirit. You're now new creations in Christ. From 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17, when he says that, the old is gone, the new has come. Behold, old has passed, the new has come. You're now new creations in Christ. Right? Powerful section. How many times have you quoted it, told people, witnessing to others you brought that up? Yes? Let's look at it and look at the verse beforehand now. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 16, when he says this, Therefore, everyone there? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore, meaning that conclusionary type word, from now on, from what? From now on. What's it say now? We regard no one according to the flesh. Let's stop right there. We regard no one according to the flesh. We give no one place or preference. We don't judge by appearance. We don't give honor or dishonor according to appearance. We don't go down that road of give honor because that's the flesh. And he give no regard to what? To flesh. Why am I held in such dis... Uh, in, 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 it's deemed harsh because I don't give honor to the flesh. I don't want to give honor to my own flesh. Come into this place here. You're not to give honor to the flesh of any guide, any regard to anyone. Child, mother, father, grandfather, aunt, uncle, somebody who president, somebody who's given themselves in place and position, and you're giving preferential treatment just because they're of the flesh. He goes, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't give place. We don't give regard. We don't listen to. We don't say, well, hey, you know, this will happen. This is the... It's not being disrespectful like, like, a, like you would in a state of rebellion. It's not, we're not talking that. We're talking is that we're not being, say, not being swayed and giving partial treatment to somebody of the natural. Yes? You understand? And he's saying in verse 16, Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him thus no longer. Meaning, the days of the flesh ended at the cross. His days of the flesh began with Virgin Mary, conceived in the womb, born of the Virgin Mary, brought forth as a child, lived his years, 12 years old, being, understanding all the things the Pharisees were saying, listening to them with understanding, coming to this place of growing, coming forth, making his ministry known, driven into the wilderness, suffered in the flesh. The Apostles' Creed, suffered in the flesh. He suffered in the flesh in the wilderness. He suffered in the flesh in the monotony of life. He suffered under the brow, the heat of the brow, the sun beating, the sun he put there, beating on his brow, sweating, walking in sandals, dirty feet, messy hair. He walked with the bugs of this earth. He walked having to eat. He walked with the need for food, the need for drink, body getting weary, subjected to devils and influence and, and temptations. And had, yet it had no regard. He gave it no regard. It had no say, no sway over him. Because he was the Christ. He is the Christ. He is God Almighty. In the same way that Christ is in you. He says, we now we knew him this way, but we know him thus no longer. He's not to come back now in the flesh. He's not coming back as Jesus in the flesh. He's now separated from it. It was crucified on the cross. You will never see him now in the body of flesh. Ever. He's now coming back as the, as the Lord of glory with all the saints in full array of who he really is. He's coming with a full arrangement, arraignment of who he is. You see a glimpse of it in the Revelation. Separated from, no longer regarding him. His days of flesh ended. This Christ is now the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He is now king, priest. Not king and priest, king priest. King dash priest. 
Not king and priest, like they're separated. It's one. Yes? It's one. It's not king and priest. It's king-priest. Together. As one. It's his title. Coming to see him who he really is. Everyone seems to like to quote verse 17. Therefore, if anyone was in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things are new. Put that, though, with verse 16. We regard no one according to the flesh. Not giving it place. Not going by its whims and its weaknesses and its whines. Listening to its whimpering and its wanton ways. Not listening to it anymore. Nope. Get into Christ. Believe God. Move with God. I can do all things through Christ who will strengthen me. Repentant. Calling upon His mercy. Trusting in His might. Trusting in His might. Relying on His mercy. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's bringing all things to pass. And you see it even here taking place. And it says when He offered up prayers, looking at Hebrews again, chapter 5, that He offered up prayers of supplications, vehement cries, tears to Him who was able to save Him from death. Vehement cries. Looking at Matthew chapter 26, verse 37. He writes this, Matthew chapter 26, verse 37. It says, he, became, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. In verse 38 of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, verse 38, it says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. In verse 39, he says this, He fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Victory. It says in verse 42, again a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Christ Almighty, yielding to the Father's will, yielding to the Father's word. Remember, Jesus said, I don't preach my own doctrine. That which I hear is what I speak. He didn't promote his own. He was fully dependent, fully surrendered, fully submissive to be in this body of flesh and to do the work under the law. He had to come fully under it and divest himself of all, of all authority and sovereignty. He was fully dependent upon the leading of the Holy Spirit even unto death, death on the cross, suffering in every way that man would. And there he beat the devil and beat death. It says here, and lastly, and was heard because of his godly fear. That's what God wants you and I. Godly fear, as we talked about earlier. Godly fear. The one that we give him the greatest regard. We regard no one, no one according to, we now regard no one according to the flesh. Why? Because I now give him full regard. You have full say and full sway over my life. You are the Lord of glory. You say, I do. You teach, I learn. You lead, I follow. You're the Father. I'm the Son. He's making you one like Jesus. But if we regard iniquity in our heart, what happens? He will not hear. It says in Psalm 66, verse 18, that if you or I or anyone regard, give place to iniquity in our heart, give it place, give it, give it an opportunity, give it say, give it sway, he will not hear you. It says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15, he says, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. That should scare us. Even though you make many prayers, I will hide my eyes from you. I will not hear. If we're regarding iniquity, if we're giving place to our own ways and doing it our own way, you can cry, call upon, I want, I wish, I'll come again. Hey, I'm, I will not hear. What does he hear? Because of godly fear, he heard him. Does that not hold true for all of us? With godly fear, I'll hear you. With godly fear, Meaning, I give you place and I give you honor. I'm not going to be swayed by this, with this cool one. I'm not going to be swayed with that position one. I'm not going to give partial treatment here. And I don't want partiality from flesh. I do not want honor or partiality. Jesus said this, I do not receive honor from men. He said that. I do not receive testimony from mere men. He's not looking for mere lips of clay to give him some flattery speech, as we see oftentimes going on today with much music, preaching, and fellowship that goes on in church world today. What is he looking for? Godly fear. How can anyone have godly fear if they're first not humble? How can pride have godly fear? They don't go together. How can we be presumptuous and say, I love the Lord? Doesn't go together. 
How can we have desires for the world and have full of fears and frets and full of weakness and wanton ways? How can we constantly be relying on our own weakness or asserting ourselves and saying, no, no, I'm following God, I love the Lord. What, does the love of, what is the love of God? First John makes it clear. What is the love of God? To obey the Lord. And His commandments are not burdensome. They're not a burden to you. They're not like, oh, God, I, I know I have to go to church. I know I have to, I know I have to, this is what he wants me to do. I know I have to obey. That's burdensome. Like when I was a kid and I was told to paint, uh, clean up the garage or shovel the driveway. Or, it was burdensome. Oh, I don't want to go out there and shovel the driveway. I mean, we, that's when we used to get snow like this. You know? You go out there with a shovel. I mean, the, the bankings were, like, you go out and you're, you're swallowed in it. My brother and I would be out there shoveling over, you know, to hit each other with a shovel a few times and, you know, shoveling the stuff. You didn't want to be out there and, you know, I just want to play in the snow. I could play in the snow eight hours. I don't want to shovel it for five minutes. Because I was told to. It was burdensome. I don't want to obey that. But all of a sudden when you find that obedience to the faith is your freedom. Obedience to the faith is learning who he is. And it's just, so, why, why, is it, why do I have such troubles obeying? Why do I have such troubles with it? Because I'm dull of hearing and I love my wanton ways. I have give desire in place to my own affections. And then I say, why don't you hear my prayers? Godly fear is what he hears. So we instead, what shall we do? Repent. Come out of the flesh. What's that trifold prescription again? Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. It is that easy. Coming into your eternal reward and all God has for you. That's how easy it is. It's a denial of the flesh. Saying no to yourself. Saying no to your wanton ways and your own personal affections and your own fears, your own weaknesses and all these things. It says, with vehement cries, if Christ himself was dealing with vehement cries, it says, if Christ himself, in Hebrews chapter 5, and says, With vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Well, then what do you think was going to come from you and I? Prayers, supplication, vehement cries and tears. What? Coming to the Lord. I'm not going to cry on this one's shoulder just so I can get some sympathy. When I can have one who will hear me and can do something about it. I'm going to call upon the living God. I know you're working out your plan. And even today, and I'm telling you this, going right now in my own personal trials it, with our family as well as with the church and all the things that are going on. And what are we doing? With, call upon, get on your knees and you say, Lord of glory, I know you're working out your plan. I know I'm part of that plan. I know I'm in that plan. I know these good people are. I know you've got us and we're calling upon the living God with vehement cries, with tears calling upon and putting out trust with all prayer and all supplication saying, Lord, I know you hear me. I know he hears me. I know it because with godly fear calling upon, I don't want to be sluggish and I don't want to have dull of hearing and I don't want to neglect so great a salvation and I want to pursue the living God and what do I want for you? Same thing. What do I want for all the young ones? Same thing. What do I want for all of the young kids? Same thing. To come alive and awaken to righteousness and pursue the living God. Not to just say, well, I go to church and I fit it in. And it's full of natural. It's full of, this is where we come, people. This is not godly fear. This is not what God would have for us. To live our own way, do our own thing. To be dull of hearing. To, not, to neglect so great a salvation. If it's right here in front of us and we don't do it, there's no other plan coming. There's no other person coming. There's no other Savior coming. There's no other Melchizedek coming. It's over. It's done with. The promises are given. And he said, hear me. Hear him. And we must. If he says, hear him, what must we do? Hear him. And if we heard him, it should stir faith to obey God. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Him. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and obeys God. Come to that place of, I want the faith to obey. And the love of God is what? To obey the commandments of God. And they're not burdensome to you. All the things of this world have grown strangely dim as the kingdom of God has come alive in you. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. May that word rest in your soul. May this teaching go forth and touch lives and spark them. People today are all looking for five, ten minute videos. This is not a five, ten minute video or teaching. How can you take the word of God and just say, well, just five minutes? I'm telling you, this is the word of God. And it's been given for us to know, to learn, to study. And when Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, give yourself entirely to the scriptures. Give yourself entirely to it. This, out of all the world, all the literature, all the words, all the languages, this is the only book that God Almighty has preserved and said, know this. This is what you need to know in Jesus' name. Amen?
Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, I thank you for these people, this church, this ministry. I thank you, Lord, for the word of God, the Holy Spirit, who makes things alive in us. I pray, Lord, that your, your salvation work would come alive in this church, not just for this generation, but for the ones to come. That it would be a beacon of light. It would be a foundational to, to build on. It would be a place where the people of God can learn of you, desire you, know you, and make you known. I pray, Lord of glory, that this message would go forth. And, and, and as it gets put online, that others would come and find it, hear it, know it, and live it. Let us not neglect so great a salvation, nor grow dull of hearing. Nor let evil heart of unbelief rob us of what you have for us, like it did for, for, the, for, the, for the people of the wilderness. Let us instead rise up and praise you. Let us not skirt the mountain. Let us instead go in fully boldly pursuing the promises of God. Let us not skirt the message or skirt the mountain, but instead yield fully to it. You said, hear him, and Lord, I want to hear. I don't want to have a church. I don't want to be a person. I don't want a family that is dull of hearing. Oh, God, help me. And that everybody also would say the same thing. Lord, that it helped me to have sharp ears. Jeremiah the prophet said that you are uncircumcised ears. Oh God, circumcise our ears of the flesh to hear the sweet nothings. We don't want to have sweet nothings. We want the power of God to come into our ears, into our heart, into our lives. That we would recognize today that the flesh profits nothing. That we are no longer to live for the flesh, for the passions and desires of the flesh, but we present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto the Lord, knowing that the body of Christ supersedes all things of the natural. We belong to you. I pray that as the temple of the Holy Spirit, every person would rise up and walk as the men and women of God they're called to be. As you called Christ and begotten him of the Father, of the Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord, that we also would recognize that we're begotten of you. We're the people of God, as you said in Malachi, they shall be mine. Lord of glory, that we would walk in that perfect way. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. amen. May the Lord of glory bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, God bless.